All right, so I, I'm passionately interested in fracture of materials. And, and the reason is that we really don't understand how materials break at the atomic level. I mean, we can study it, we can work with the material, but we don't understand how it, how it breaks. And so I would like to understand that. And one of the things that I, I've done to try to understand that and tie everything together is to use fractal geometry. Fractal geometry is a non-Euclidean geometry that allows for non-integer dimensions. So we're used to thinking about one-dimensional, two-dimensional, three-dimensional objects. There's a geometry that allows 1.2, 1.3, or 2.2. In our case, for fracture surfaces, when things break and they form a fracture surface, it isn't just a plane. It is very tortuous. Well, now we can give a quantitative number to that. So we can identify the materials and how tortuous they are by their fractal dimension. The interesting thing is that the fractal dimension is related to the toughness of the material. So that if a material is more tough, it has a, a greater fractal dimension. And so we can correlate that. There are different structures. The important thing about the fractal dimension is that it gives us a tool to scale from the atomic level to the macroscopic level. Because what a, a fractal structure is self-similar and scale invariant. That means it looks the same all over the place, statistically. And it means that unless I tell you what the scale bar is, you can't tell at what magnification you're looking at it. So all the way from where the, ato the atoms break, all the way up to what we see macroscopically, either through a microscope or even with our eyes, it's the same thing. So that is the key, I think, the, the really tool that we can use to tie everything together from when the atoms break and the shape and the geometry that they form to what we see as a fracture surface. And the fact that we can relate that back to toughness gives us a tool to design at the atomic level for things that are macroscopic. So that's why I think it's really important. We can look at it at a lot of different length scales, and, and certainly for people that know me know that I'm extremely interested in fractography, looking at the fracture surface of the material. But now we can look at the fracture surface both at the atomic scale and the macro scale and have a way, even though they look differently to our eyes, mathematically they're the same. And so we have to use analytical models that can look at the breaking of bonds from a quantum mechanics viewpoint, but that gives us structure that will give us the, the macro structure that we look at. So it's, we can go either way. We can build up from the atomic level and to show how these, the, the changes in the bonds, because the bonds don't just come apart. They actually turn and they reform and they regroup and they form a new structure. And then once we can look at that structure, either by modeling or high resolution uh, microscopy, we can then see how it forms into the macro structures that we look at. Th there are several things that uh, are helping in, in terms of uh, being able to apply fractal geometry. One is the acknowledgement that materials break in a fractal manner. So somebody has to acknowledge that. The other thing are the tools available for modeling at the atomic scale. And, and what uh, the, I guess, the leading edge right now of modeling is to be able to link all those scales up. Because we have, we have tools that we can look at the quantum level, and we have tools that look at sort of the meso level, and we have tools that look at the macro level, like finite element analysis. The linking between those levels, they aren't right now they're not quite compatible. And so that's the next generation is to uh, handshake between the different levels and to be able to model uh, from the atomic, say using quantum mechanics tools, all the way up to the macro where we can use finite element to get large structures. And so that's what's exciting about, about all this field. If you acknowledge the fact that fracture is controlled at the atomic level, so we can now start looking at what can we do to the bonding to fool 
brittle materials into becoming ductile, or at least non-brittle, you know, on the atomic level. So if we can put in certain atoms that uh, fool the material and we can change the way that it fractures, we may be able to design on the atomic scale or even subatomic scale. Yeah, the, the really neat thing about this is that we can apply it at many, many different levels. We can use it in research, of course, in trying to just understand fundamental things. But for example, I've, I've applied it to uh, the dental field. Uh, if we can measure the fractal dimension of a material that's used for, say, crowns, uh, that's a ceramic, if they break, accidentally usually you know they'll break in the mouth or something and if they can save a piece of it and they don't have to find the origin they just have to save a piece of it we can get the fractal dimension if that fractal dimension is the same as we expect for that material then it was probably an overload that caused it to fail however if the fractal dimension isn't the same it's probably in the manufacturing of the material and so we were able to aid the dentist may not like it but we we're able to detect why the thing failed in, in general principles. We've also used it in uh, hybrid bearings, for example, for um, hybrid bearings are uh, a combination of metal and ceramic materials that are used in, in bearings. So for example, the Space Shuttle Discovery has uh, hybrid bearings in the liquid uh, oxygen um, system. And the, uh, the balls in those are silicon nitride. And they're actually quite resistant to wear, but when they do wear, the question was, was the mechanism? And the mechanism turned out to be different than for metal bearings. And they're, they're, it's actually a fracture process. It's a microscopic fracture process. And we were able to show that by measuring the fractal dimension on the uh, material that, that came out, the, the, on the fracture surface was left, and compared it to what we did in the laboratory. And they had the same fractal dimension and among other things, we were able to show that it was a fracture process and exactly how it took place. So then we're able to then know how we have to control the outside flaws, the size of the flaws, in order to make sure that it doesn't happen in service.